Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. Today's guest is Jay Tuthill. Now look, when I first started talking with some of his employees, and we'll get to Jay in a second here, I met Chad Gabriel and Vito Pelicano. Both of those episodes are linked in the show notes. You can go to breakitdownshow.com and you can find their episodes there. And they both work on a project that Tuthill sponsors called Search for Aliveness, where they go around the world and they look for what they call aliveness. Now, we've talked about this topic a number of times. And each time I talked to these guys, to Chad in his own episode and Vito in his, it dawned on me that Jay was doing something different, something special. Yes, the search for aliveness is important, but the culture that he was creating, and anybody who knows me knows that I'm big on CQ and culture, and it's one of the things that I do for work is to advise companies and corporations on culture. When I can hear Vito and Chad truly light up when talking about their workplace, think about how rare that is where someone's like, oh my God, yeah, we have the best environment. Even if you want to leave and do something else, we find the best way to get you to that next step so you can truly be alive. And I had to talk to Jay to get his philosophy on this because that doesn't make sense for a guy that owns a manufacturing company. But sure enough, we had him on the show and Jay talks extensively about how he takes his father's approach, which for the time was appropriate. It was a command and control, a C2 based environment approach. And he said, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't work for me. That isn't the corporation that I want to create and run. And so he started to look at CQ, the intelligence, the cultural intelligence, the cultural acuity part of it. It's one thing to say, oh, we're going to create this culture within our corporation. It's a whole nother thing to be willing to slow down to do it right and to measure it. And one of the ways you measure it is have guys like Vito saying, oh my God, it's the best place to work for these specific reasons. When they can, when I can hear through these other employees, the hallmarks of what Jay has put out culturally, that stands out and is exceptional. And I think you guys will all appreciate what Jay has to talk to us about. And also, by the way, about two weeks ago, we put up our episode with Bob Taylor, who makes guitars. And these are corporate leaders who are doing something special to make the world a better place through their corporation. And I'm all about supporting that and exploring that topic. We'll be doing more of that in the future. All right, listen, if you do like what we do, here's what you can do for me. Share the show. Tell a friend about the show. Put a Facebook post up. That would be fantastically helpful. Find an episode that you love, even if it's an older one, and share that show. If you uh, want to find a back catalog show, hit me up, Pete, at BreakItDownShow.com. I'll give you some to try out. You let me know which ones you like. I'm always interested in what you think. I'm always interested in your guest ideas. I do my best to get everybody that I can that makes sense for the show. One more thing to bring up. Save the Brave, save the brave.org. You know what to do. Here comes Jay Tuthill. Lions Rock Productions. <laughs> This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Well, hi. This is Jay Tuthill on The Break It Down Show. And I really love that we get a chance to do this. We've had Chad Gabriel on. We've had Vito Pelicano on. And now we have the boss man. We have Jay Tuthill of the Tuthill Corporation. And he's going to talk to us about uh, his company, the culture that he's created, his sort of his ideas about mindfulness and how, how people, how you, how you take care of the people around you and look beyond the, the corporation. And we're exploring this because and really you guys should go listen to those other two episodes and, and learn about their project called the search for aliveness. But the reason why I wanted to bring Jay on is, is, is as I study culture, you know, from being in Iraq or Afghanistan or working for corporations to help them understand their culture, I don't often come across a, you know, employees that are so, that reflect the culture so powerfully, Jay. You know, I, I, this is just a big question to start us off, and we'll dig in deep. But how does it make you feel that you inspired me to reach out to you based upon the comments and the engagement that Chad and Vito displayed? Oh boy. Uh, well, it, it makes me feel good. Of course, it's it's another of the of the signposts along the road that you know, even in, on the bad days, can look at those at those little signs that we, we come by and, and uh, it confirms, confirms we're going in a good direction. Yeah, that direction is hard to accomplish. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, well, let's go back. Let's, let's talk a little bit about Tut Hill's uh, origin and how you 
became, you know, the guy on the outside of the building. Um, is, you took it over from your dad, right? I did. I'm I'm actually fourth generation. Wow. And you know, I <laughs> a very simple way to summarize my earlier years of leadership were, you know, gosh, I was trying not to screw things up and and unconsciously trying to do things like my father did things. He, he's an ex-Army West Point guy, command and control, mm-hmm. kind of typical, I guess, for his generation. And um, you know what? It took me way too long, but I finally figured out it wasn't working for me. How did you figure that out? I mean, that's how you grew up. That's, you know, very much a... To this day, you know, C2, command and control, uh, that's how you run things. Um, uh, talk about some of your, your learning points where you're like, this isn't, this isn't my way of doing this. You know, I, I always had a picture of myself as, you know, kind of a smart guy and approachable and um, possibly even intuitive. And I may have been all those things, but coming at it from the perspective that You know, I had to have the right answer all the time. And I had to be the smartest guy in the room. And, you know, all these ideas had to come from me. And when it wasn't going that way, I'd get scared. I'd say, again, not not consciously, but somewhere deep in the in the gremlins, you know, I'm giving myself the message, you know, you're losing control. You got to ramp it up. You've got to prove that you can command these these people. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that works great in the military. I know it doesn't work very well out there in the, in the civilian world. And so I had some, I had some very, uh, rough moments and you know what, it's, um, very closely connected to, uh, to our entire aliveness program because I, I had to finally, and I had some help, believe me had to finally come face to face with the fact that authenticity, my score was really low. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I worked as a lost and uh, not very happy uh, salesperson at CDW. You're probably familiar with them. They're a Midwestern company. Sure. And uh, one day, Michael Krasny, the guy that built these things with his bare hands, you know, started selling computers out of magazines and realized it just kept going. And he's there and he's yucking it up with all these people and serving us lunch, you know, trying to be a man of the people. And I just, you know, I'll take the free lunch because I can't afford it to not to. But I look at him and I think this guy's no idea how disconnected I am from the vision he thinks, you know, like I'm so, and then they had a a thing called inclusion training, which made me feel even more excluded from the company, you know? And so you have, yeah. And and look, the guy wasn't a bad guy. It's just, he had this vision of what was going on and I knew all of us, you know, who were on the sales floor and how grinding the experience was. And it's okay to make it hard, but it wasn't hard. It was miserable. And if you want to make your people miserable, you're going to lose really good people. And sure enough, when I look around my peers 20 years ago at that company, a lot of them are very, very, very senior positions in other professions that are akin to his. And so that's all that talent that just left in part because of, you know, the day-to-day apathy about our well-being. Well, I know in my case, Pete, the um, I had I had... Well, I hired a personal coach because, frankly, I didn't know what the heck else to do. Okay. And I figured a personal coach was somehow about you know, business. Hmm. Well, it turns out she was way more capable than that. And it's, you know, it's really about a life coach. And in my case, I mean, her, her two favorite words from the very beginning were awareness and responsibility. Hmm. You know, you've got to be able to see yourself, got to be able to see how Others are reacting to you, and you've got to take your share of the responsibility for doing something about it if you don't like what you see. And um, that really was the beginning of what was, at first, a very, very intense personal process and kind of ouchy at times. And sometimes one of those signposts would come along, and it would, uh, it would make a big impact on me. And, and so all of a sudden, I started talking with with my team at work and talking about, you know, this kind of what for me was really a a new understanding of, of authenticity. And 
And I thought, you know, how can we do this? Because selfishly, I want to live in a place where authenticity is the norm. Yeah. I want to, I want to work at an office where that's the case. I mean, <laughs> it was like, I don't know if we can pull this off, but man, how cool would that be? Yeah. And so we started pulling that apart. You know, what, what is it? And, you know, it got to the point where it was really clear to all of us that if you want authenticity, you gotta, you gotta look inside first. Okay. So authenticity is a bit of a buzzword though, right? Like, you know, ramping up and, and peeling the onion and all these kind of things that we say. So it's really easy to say that and have your coach say, you need to be authentic, but, but like no fooling when those road signs come up and, and the way I see these things is you can't look directly at the problem because you won't see the, the obvious solution or entry point, right? You know, you're coming at it too direct with too much ego in it. You have to sort of have these road signs that indicate, Hey, there may be a problem over here. And if authenticity is one of them, how, how were you even able to see that? Or what did your coach bring out in you and say, this, this seems like this is ego. Like you continue to say, I, me, my, instead of us and them and, you know, and celebrating other things. So authenticity is, is uh, a great goal, but how in the world do you achieve it? <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, here's the simple fact about it. Uh -huh. As soon as you, as you try to achieve it, it's not authentic. <laughs> Right, exactly. No, it's, I mean, it's really crazy. It is. And it's I so liken it to like the drunk guy in the bar, like, I'm not drunk. You know, like the first guy to say they're not drunk <laughs> is the drunkest guy in the bar, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's like that. And so <laughs> what, what she was really good mm -hmm. uh, for me mm -hmm. about doing was she would catch me being authentic. And she'd stop whatever we were talking about. And she said, there. That last 15 seconds, you didn't think about it. You just expressed it, and it came from somewhere deep inside. Yeah. And it's, it's a, that was an amazingly powerful tool for me, and I've, I've shared that with others, you know, because if we think really hard, it's by definition going to come from a, an ego place. Yeah. And if we, just, if we just let it happen, and then we start getting familiar with what that feels like, to just let it happen and, and just be me, it's like, oh, I know that feeling. I'm going back there. Yeah, it's a feeling. And also, I think for me, and, and this goes just in my general work as I teach people how to like, you know, run podcasts and do interviews. When you slow down and truly hear what you're saying, the words coming out of your mouth and you're processing them, just a click before they come out, you start to drop the ums and the ahs. And you get to get to be a lot more direct because you're you're just taking a more measured approach to it, and and that ego lives in that initial reproach instead of the measured, right? And so you you want to say something, and let me make sure I ask this question because I need to feel good about it, and then I realize that's not the right question. The question is about you know the guest. How do I make the guest's uh, specific knowledge shine? So what are some of the things you would hear yourself say as, as you started to tune this machine and go measured? And then immediate or however you, I don't know how you even balance it. I don't want to assume that, but talk about that process between, you know, the detune and attuning your approach and your words and your actions. Well, you know, it, it, I'm going to go back to self-awareness mm. and, um, you know, it, it, this is, this is funny. I mean, a little, a little strange, but our listeners may be able to relate to it. Again, I, I followed my father in business. I followed a lot of his example. Um, he was a very successful guy. Um, and it turns out that I'm much more like my mother. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I really am more comfortable in, in kind of the human, emotional, intuitive, connected sort of a way. And, and that may give you a little bit of an idea why... I didn't do so well in the command and control world. And, right. and so really, once I, got, once I got accustomed to that feeling and I could be, then begin to trust that feeling, all of a sudden, you know, I didn't have to have the answer. I maybe had to have the right question and I could participate in the formulation of the answer, but it would be the best answer that the group could come up with in that moment. And so we're striving for the best, not defending my turf right okay really big difference 
Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a, man, I love that. You know, yeah. that's, that's so good. I'm not even going to ask another question on that because I, I think you've just perfectly captured it. Let, let's talk a little bit about dignity because you said that, you know, as we were talking off mic, and I think dignity is such an important thing. You know, I, I, um, one of the things I try to preach is, you know, you should, you should search and collect for joy. And you ask, you know, I'll ask someone like, when was the last time you just had uproarious joy, like arms above the head, like, oh my God, you know, and it's easy <laughs> to find the anger, right? Like, oh, I was so mad at the airport last night when I was flying, right? It's easy to do that, but that joy in collecting that and then creating dignity and defaulting to grace, you know, these are things that, look, I, I just don't know that the the negatives are, are in any way outweigh the positives of, of just defaulting to grace all the time. Now, sometimes you can't be graceful. Sometimes you have to really blast somebody or whatever, but, but what if you did that by design as opposed to by reaction, you know? Yeah, let's let's acknowledge up front. Um, you know, the clock on the wall tells us a lot about the range of tools we have at our disposal. If we're if we're coaching somebody and trying to get them to live into their true self, you know, that's that's a project that takes months and often years. But if we're trying to avoid getting hit by the bus, in the next 32 seconds, um, a lot of that stuff just falls away and, and we go right to action. Right. And it's really important to remember. I mean, it's obvious, of course, but it's really important to remember so we don't get stuck with only one tool at our disposal. That's not real life. But yeah. you asked about dignity. Yes. Now, let me, let me turn that around and ask you. Sure. What human being, when they're born, doesn't deserve dignity? Yeah, I mean, they all do, right? They all do. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and of course, as we go through life, we may we may give up our right or forfeit our right to dignity by the choices we make. But let's let's take that as an outlier and focus on the mainstream. And, you know, how how can any of us feel alive if we can't see that birthright of dignity. How can, how can we do that? Really creating dignity. I think the, f the first step is showing the grace of granting that dignity, dignity to this person, which is really the first step in creating some space for them that maybe they've never enjoyed before a safe space where they can begin to maybe flap their wings a little bit and yeah. start drying them out. And start getting ready for that next step, which might be actually lifting off and, and flying a little bit and, <laughs> and, and onward. And so I, I just think dignity is really the entry point for what we're trying to do here. Yeah. We create space yeah. and we, we invite folks to eventually fly away and become exactly the person they were put here to be. Man, that is so powerful to to take that approach to things. I mean, you think about, you know, the, the same kind of question, like what person doesn't want to be a little better, doesn't want to impress their boss, doesn't want to do a great job, you know, that everybody wants to do those things. But if we smash them down all the time, if we only have negative, in, you know, uh, input for them, you know, they're like, why am I bothering flapping my wings? Apparently I suck. You know, again, back to my time at CDW <laughs> and, and I'm not trying to bash these guys, but you know, they're a very big corporation and they had these problems is, you know, my boss would tell me all the reasons why I sucked and the numbers on the wall would, would indicate that I sucked, but I could do math. And I'm like, Hey man, don't tell me I suck. You're taking the net, net, net gravy money that I, that I create here. And over the course of a year, I cover four people's salaries by myself. So, I might be the worst guy on the floor, and I wasn't, but I might be the worst guy on the floor, but don't tell me I'm terrible because I can add. There's a thousand salespeople in this building, you know, <laughs> like we, 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 it just didn't, it wasn't authentic and it, it totally denied me dignity. It's like I had no chance to ever meet my goal. And when I did, it was like, well, that's your job. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is soul crushing. And you can't have your soul crushed and have dignity at the same time. It's uh, it's courageous though, man. It's courageous to to let dignity drive what you do. Again, like how do you get to that spot? 
you know, my my favorite answer to that question is in my earlier days, we, we had a, a heavy machining plant in Ohio. And some of the biggest and most complex screw machines I've ever seen. And, and way in the back of the building, literally in the corner of the building, were the two biggest machines and the biggest operator in the whole building. A big, powerful man with a full beard and a rather gruff demeanor. Now, if you can picture this, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, so here I come walking through. And, you know, I'm the visiting guy from Chicago with the name on building and all that stuff. And and uh, he wasn't very interested in talking to me. In fact, he'd see me and he'd go hide behind his machines. I actually got him to talk, but not much. And I, I couldn't, I just couldn't forget this guy. I mean, we're no longer associated with that business. Um, and I hope he's still there and hope he's prospering and however he may define it. But I just hated the idea of being the guy running the company where where it just seems so dead ended. And you know, come on. He he didn't seem to express a huge amount of of drive to make things different. I mean, he was pretty good at his job, I was told, but it just felt so dead ended to me and I I wanted to do something about it. And you know, it kind of gets back to aliveness and dignity. I wanted to be a place where people could could become their dreams and hopefully have a very successful career in a, in a healthy family all at the same time. Mm. And moping around and you know being surly at work all the time is probably not a good foundation for walking in the door at four o'clock and greet your family. Yeah. So... And I knew damn well. I mean, we have a saying, you may have heard it from Chad and Vito, but, um, you know, we we don't want just your hands, talking about a machinist, for example. Right. We want your, we want your head and we want your heart. We want all three. Wow. Yeah. Now think about that. Think about using this guy's, I'm, I'm back to my big screw machine operator. Think about using all of his experience, all of his talents, and getting his heart and his head along with those things. I mean, that's unbeatable. Yeah. That's unbeatable. And that is, I guess, my long-winded answer. Of why the why the heck do I think this is good capitalism? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and thanks for doing my job for me. I was going to take us right to that spot, you know, because this guy literally was at the end of the building, you know, in a dead end. And uh so here's the thing that I, I, I like to do. So I'm, I'm overseas, I'm working in a complex place, and I've got a leader, and I'm trying to tease them out, but not dominate them, you know? So very easy for a command and control-based, you know, thinker to say, here we go, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do that, and here's this big blue arrow of operations that's going to lead to your success, Muhammad, you know? And then, hey, <laughs> <laughs> it never works, man. Um. So I would say, okay, I have to get my ego out. And I made these mistakes. Jay, I made these mistakes daily. I'm like, God dang it. Like, that's that's me again. I've got to let them do it. I've got to, you know, and it took me months to learn how to get this one guy to crack open. This is me working at my best. Like the system worked, but now I was tinkering and fine tuning and polishing and making it really pretty. And I still made mistakes all the time. So one of the things I like to do is get my partner up and out of the building and in their space, like in this case, it was walking up and down the main street of this town that, that used to be and wasn't at the time. And keep in mind now, this is all paralleled by the Army's desire to say, hey, we're going to rebuild this bazaar. We're going to put money into it. We're going to make it alive again. And I would see people brief all the time on the status of this thing. And I'd be out there like, there's nothing but clay buildings out here, right? And so I needed to see what he thought it was going to look like. And so I walked him down this street and I'm like, well, what's here? What's there? Who's the guy that's going to run this place? And he had answers for all this. And a lot of times he knew the guy because he knew the guy that used to run it. And he's like, I'm going to have this guy running this place again one day. And what he didn't need was millions of American dollars. He didn't want there to be a sewing machine factory. You know, he's like, this place is already accounted for. So a whole different view of, of what 
that was going to look like, and it's a capitalist answer, by the way, was by getting him to describe where he was going so I could now get in line with his vision and keep the army from overpowering his vision and just say, look, these are these small areas where he needs our help because he needs expertise or maybe he needs some some garbage, literally garbage, you know, our waste to, to make these things happen and to nudge us towards this thing. And this is kind of a long-winded explanation, but this is akin to what you're talking about where... Uh, having letting that person have that vision to describe where they were going, and now I'm provisioning a vision. I don't have to. I don't have to provision the whole thing. I just have to work. Worry about like where they're at in that immediate moment, and and not get 15 steps or 15 miles ahead of them, and just go. Let's work right here, right here where where the, where the rubble is. Let me help you pick up some of these rocks. Does that make sense? Sure, it does. You know, that, it kind of gets back to something I'd mentioned earlier, which is you know that. The command and control guy is going to have an answer, but almost by definition, it's a suboptimal answer. Right. And so what, what you were, you were taking that walk in search of the best answer with all the complexities woven into it. And you got to be open to that or it, you fritter it away. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> and what you realize when you do this walk or you, you, and you avoid the frittering is uh, he had an inn, a tavern that used to be there. And of course, because we were in the middle of nowhere. So you finally get to the beginning of the you know middle of nowhere. You need a place to sit down, maybe hole up for the night. It's a cold place, you know? And so the army had never even thought to brief about a tavern or a hotel. And I say hotel, you know, let's be honest. It's going to be some rolls on the floor, but that's how they do it out there. But when I was able to bring that back to the command and say, do you guys realize there's going to be a Motel 6? And it's already there, and he already knows the guy that used to run it. Like, oh my God, you know, now we're talking about something that is a lot easier to provision because now we can see the franchise and and we can look for ways to to get involved in that process, but not in a way that also, by the way, if you do it too fast, the Taliban's like, hey, you're working with the Americans, and now we're going to at least, you know, make your life difficult, if not make your life end. So these are dangerous, complex problems, but it was always more about how they wanted to approach it and, and what they saw. I, I want to get back into the capitalism side of things. Um, we have Bob Taylor from Taylor Guitars on, and he is a, a, an impassioned environmentalist. And, you know, his industry, you know, they, they pull, at, you know, exotic woods like ebony and koa out of Hawaii and, and out of the coast of Africa. And, you know, the social responsibility of doing that in a way that makes sense, that's fair trade with the folks there, that that doesn't encourage piracy like amongst themselves to go out and bring ebony in illegally and just was was super passionate about getting this right. And then started talking about the ancient wood. Like, you know, imagine in a town like Chicago or Minnesota, all these old trees that are 100 years old at some point have to come down. Why not, if you're going to sequester carbon, why not leave it sequestered in that tree and turn it into a table, a, a countertop, a guitar, instead of just sending it somewhere to get chipped up and turned into mulch or, or uh, you know, firewood somewhere. And so all of these things. But this came from someone who's who's got a very, like an industry leading brand, and he's passionate about this. I don't know that that there's a better mechanism than having someone who runs a company and saying, this is where we're going to improve the world. Just at our one little, our little spike on the chart, this is what we're going to do better than anybody else. That's sort of what I see about the value of capitalism. You're creating dignity in your employees so they can go out and do what they need to do. I think that's incredible. Well, anybody that can make guitars as lovely as Taylor, I mean, ought to be a smart guy. So I'm happy to hear your story. Yeah. You know, I, Gosh, just open up the paper, and it's easy to read examples of capitalism that's not ah, not the product of larger thinking, but it's the product of rather smaller, rather selfish thinking. And so, you know, capitalism gets gets a rap, and sometimes that rap is accurate. But I think when we breathe humanity into capitalism— and we make it, hey, wait, these are profit-making ventures. We better make profits or we go out of business. So I'm not going to badmouth profits at right. all. But there are so many different ways to go after profits, to have a thriving business so that you can then perhaps be successful enough that you can invite others to thrive, some of them inside your business and some of them in their own lives. And that's 
that's you know we're we're lucky enough to be able to do that now. But you know, honestly, you asked me what are some of my bigger, longer goals. It's it's to get rid of the selfishness in capitalism. Mm. It's it's a, a you know a, a short minded approach anyway. And God, I'm I'm way from the first guy to ever say that. It, but it, I just believe it works. And I think I've got a, you know a bunch of examples that says capitalism well executed does exactly what Taylor Guitars is doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And you also said something else that I'm passionate about is. I mean, like with my show, I try to create value. I asked you, like, what can we get out of this show for you so there's value in this for you? And in turn, that makes value for the audience because they're hearing, you know, a new approach. Maybe it's the same words. Maybe we've said the same words that everybody else has said, but it's in a way that somebody else hears it and it sticks for them. So, you know, I'm always looking for value. You're talking about creating value in your company through profit, but also you're doing it through people. And and I would I would submit that. And I think you've basically have said this, like if someone goes somewhere else and they're a valuable person, that, that's a that's a KPI. That's a performance indicator that you guys are creating valuable people. And even if they've got a, if their path is to go somewhere else, they should go there and do whatever that thing is. Who knows why they have to move or leave or whatever. But if you're able to reliably create people that have a ton of value for any corporation they go to. It takes the Tut Hill brand and name and elevates it because it's like anybody can get out of Tut Hill. You know, then you have the problem of every people recruiting your people all the time. But yeah, yeah I'd be okay with that problem. Well, it's uh, <laughs> I, I got I got to ask you about accountability. Sure. And this, this connects. Just bear with me here. When I say the word accountability, what what comes up inside of you? Accountability to me is like to my mission, to my people, you know, a am I doing what I'm supposed to do to balance my ledger? You know, I am I, if I'm not a pro, am I working on being a pro? Am I reading books? Am I constantly improving, you know, by family? You know, am I working hard enough to, to do what I need to do for them? That's my accountability. That's where I go. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. That's my accountability. That's where I go. Okay, well, just the energy with which you, you, you said that. I mean, you you go to a pretty healthy version of accountability. Now, I got to tell you, growing up with with my dear father, uh -huh. um, I was very conditioned to being held accountable, and it was never pleasant. Hmm. I'm not saying I'm not saying I didn't deserve it, right? But it was account accountability, you know, like getting stepped on. Uh huh. And and one of the more important discoveries for me in this whole process of bringing aliveness inside our company is, is to find a completely different approach, a different energy for holding people accountable. And just, just imagine a performance review um, going something like this. Well, John, you know, I see, I see of your, you know, your five quantifiable goals that we're not doing very well. <laughs> and we're going to, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. But what I want, what I want you to listen for in, in my, in, in my criticism here, John, is I know, I know when you choose to stand over here and be that guy, you can nail these things without even working too hard. But for reasons I don't understand, you don't stand over there. You stand over way over here. And from there, it's a real effort to be effective. And so okay, we've got the evidence, something's not fitting. Let's talk about it, okay? If I can help you stand in that first place where you're so powerful and capable, I'm going to do that. So, and then John says, you know what? I don't like to stand over here because that's not who I really am. I want to, I want to, I want to stand in this place where I don't, let's just say, we, I don't have to talk to people and tell them what to do. And that conversation ends up in a place where, where we agree. And I, I literally mean agree uh -huh. that for what you want, you're either in the wrong job or you're at the wrong company. So let's, let's change this conversation 
to finding something that is really going to make your heart sing, John, because if it doesn't sing, it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for us. And so that's a different take on accountability than I will promise you I, I grew up with. Yeah. And, you know, so we have, we've invited people to start looking for a job outside the company because my favorite example is you want to write children's books and we're just not going to be able to help you with that, but we can sure help the transition. Yeah. So what does that transition look like? I'm sure the audience is dying to know. So Pete comes to you and says, I, I just got, I, I want to write children's books. I, I don't want to run this, uh, this, you know, this machine as a machinist anymore. H- how does Tut Hill help? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how I want it to be. And I'm not going to tell you it always works this way. Of course. Um, but what I, what I encourage our folks to do is say, all right, Look, I'm gonna. Uh, when do you see this happening? We kind of agree on a on a target schedule, yeah. so that allows us to make sure we've got you know backup backups ready in the queue, what have you. And you know what? If you want to if you want to take Fridays off uh, to to further your job search, you know what? We can plan around that. We'll do that. And um, you know, but let's agree that you know by May fifteenth, we're, we're going to have to just go ahead and make this happen. And that's probably good for you too to have a deadline out there. And yeah. you know, John says, "Yep, yeah, okay, got it. Let's let's go." Do, do you um, do you try to connect them to an outside resource? Like I'm really big on like you need to find a mentor, someone two or three, seven levels above where you're at in your desired industry. Do you try to link people into resources like that? You know, sometimes sometimes we may have a connection. Mm. If it's as far afield as children's books, probably not. Right. Fair enough. Um, but, you know, that's where it's so important for people to understand that, you know, for them to to really be in control of their lives, they've got to take the responsibility for that. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's as simple as that person. And a lot of ways that person has to reach out because they've got to find someone they're inspired by, not someone that you think they might be inspired by. You know, it might work when you recommend someone, but really it is that person carrying that water to that location and saying, this is the water I brought, you know, and, and it really is on them. This sort of brings us naturally to the point of talking about this aliveness, the search for it. And first off, this is expensive, man. <laughs> I mean, the cost to send a film crew to a foreign country to, to edit and take all this time. This is you're paying your people to create this thing. Uh, why on earth would you do that? But what more importantly, why is it so important to you to do that? Oh man, this this could be a long answer. Let me see if I can be smarter than than that. But the all right. First, first of all, let's let's tackle the obvious. Um, one of the audiences for this film is absolutely our own people. So let's call those the inside audience. Mm-hmm. Why is that important? Well, honestly. Um, I want them to see in, in lots of different examples what we're trying to create. And, you know, they may, they may have a number of good examples in their plant. I certainly hope that they do. Um, but to see this in, out in the bigger world, just good, good information. Um, and, and with the message, hey, we're serious. And right. please join us. If you haven't yet tossed your, tossed your hat in the ring, now's a good time. Second audience is a very humbling number of, what is it, 8 billion people. Mm. Um, you know, we, all we can hope to do there with a touch as, as light as a video, um, all we can do there is hope to ignite a little spark of possibility in somebody that their heart already wants it, but their mind maybe hasn't permitted that. And if we can provoke that spark, that's a good beginning. And um, and our humble, well, our purpose, uh, wake the world. Right. First, the first time I didn't come up with that. I've forgotten exactly who did. But first time I heard it, I went running for the hills. <laughs> I mean, you know, here we are, a mid-sized manufacturer based in Chicago. Who the hell are we to be claiming that as our purpose? <laughs> right. And of course, with a little seasoning, it's 
it's a hell of an exciting thing to, to say and just watch people's faces. So and the other the other thing about the search for aliveness is it it gives all of us um, a chance to expand our understanding and hopefully start building some muscles in in the area. So it, it, it underpinning it all is my belief the world is hungry for meaning. And I got to say they're hungrier today than they were a year or two or three ago. And um, gosh, aliveness is all about meaning. Yeah. That, the way that I see this, this project as you describe it is, you know, there are a lot of people out there. You want to wake the world or illuminate, you know, the world to, to things because, you know, it's easy to be wrapped up in our own personal fear. You know, you're on the edge of this, uh, I want to write children's books cliff and uh, you'd be crazy to jump off. But, but and let me say this in a, the best way I can <clears throat> try here. You have to jump off a cliff to do that. Like you shouldn't start a podcast and, and try to make that your profession. That's crazy. Look at all the problems that come with that, how challenging it is. Like you'd never I would advise someone to do that except for, you know, you have, there are, are torches out there. There are, little search of aliveness video kind of things where you're like, I really maybe can do this. And, and you guys are sort of illuminating and getting rid of the darkness so that the fear can be reduced and the person might overcome that fear and take that jump that they need to make to, to go for that thing that truly does enrich their life. And, and by trying to wake the world or enrich lives, you're, you're illuminating things that are way far afield from, from where someone is. We, we had Andy Summers on the show. And he's a guitarist for the police. And that's what he was known for 40 years ago. But that's that's his most notable work. And I was able to ask him, because he's a photographer, he's a spoken word guy, obviously a musician, you know, who's who's in front of you artistically? And he's like, it doesn't work like that. I'm the artist. No one's in front of me. I'm I'm going in my direction. And those people that like what I do, they follow me because that's my job. I have the vision and I push it as hard as I'm able to push it. And that's sort of what you guys are doing. You've got this artistic approach to saying, hey, look at me over here. We're out here in left field. It's pretty cool out here. You know, maybe you can do this too. And whatever this is up to the person. But I, 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 that's my vibe for how you guys are approaching this. And when I watch the videos, I see these incredible stories that you're – look, first off, you know, I'm a big affective or effect guy. You watch the videos you have to have an impacted emotional response because they're just the videos are wonderfully crafted and the stories you guys tell, you really are waking the world. You know, I, I want to tell you a quick story. I think, I think one of the very most difficult positions we have in our society here in the United States, obviously it exists elsewhere, but I'm really thinking domestically here uh -huh. is the, is the, the mom who has a full-time job outside the house. Oof. Yeah. And, you know, so she works her butt off all day long and goes home and works her butt off until she falls into bed and then gets up and does it all again. And one of the central measures of alivement uh, that we use is, uh, are you pursuing your wants, your personal wants? In fact, do you even understand what your personal wants are? Those things that you'd like to be involved with and like to accomplish that just make your heart pump stronger than hell. And, um, and I remember we were in a, in a retreat setting and a, a classic example of this earnest young mom who was just getting burned out. We started talking about, you know, what do you want in life and how can you design a plan that brings you ever closer to your central wants? Mm. And she was very upset with me. I was, I was holding this out, out as the keys to the castle. And she finally just came out and said in a rather direct manner, that is the most selfish, self-righteous question I've ever heard. I am so busy taking care of others at this stage in my life. I, there's no place for a selfish thought in me. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, can't you understand that? I mean, doesn't sound like a recipe for long-term success, but can't you understand that? Yeah. So anyway, in the conversation, not just with me, but over the course of a three-day uh, three retreat, um, we got her to 
understand or admit to some degree that if she was not able to find ways to charge her own battery, it was going to get increasingly difficult to be there for her loved ones or for her job. But the, um, uh, and, you know, I got to say, you know, I, I, I still run across this woman, and this is some 10 years later, uh, and I, I can't claim much credit for this at all. I, you know, whatever she's done, she's done it. But she smiles in a way she didn't used to. She's been promoted. She's got a job with that could have landed more heavily upon her, but she seems to be able to handle it very well. And, you know, gosh, that's just a little story, but don't you want that for everybody? Boy, yeah, yeah. And, and what a great example. I mean, I love the hell out of moms and respect, like, everything that they do because it's special, you know? And you're right. If they don't invest even a little bit uh, in themselves, in their own well-being, they are going to break. You know, they are going to get sick. You know, I'm not trying to give moms cancer or anything like that at all, but it's true. You know, you can't spend 25 years of your life just working for others and come out the other end and go, okay, now I'm going to focus on, it just doesn't work that way. You know, that transition is not a reliable transition. And again, it's not to be selfish. It's to be, it's to care about your loved ones. It's accountability again, you know, to like this, I have to do for me and you guys have to allow this so I can make sure that I'm there for you as much as I want to be, you know, and, and maintain that system and not, not create a system of just withdrawals, but you have to have some investment. I, I totally agree with that. And what a challenging thing to try to illustrate for somebody because you tell a mom that she should take time away from her kids to invest in herself and you're going to get that response like the hell I am. <laughs> well, live and learn, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but really, though, why why take all this on, Jay? I mean, you've got enough to do. you got, I mean, a thriving business. Why take on this thing? Is this a is this a risk for you to to focus your attention on these secondary and tertiary things? Hmm. Thanks for that question. Um, you know, I'm I'm 66 years old, and and I'm clearly burned out when it comes to the the day to day demands on on running the business. So I've stepped away from that, um, and I'm still really in, engaged. I mean, my heart is still very much with the company. And while you know, I, I get drawn into operational things occasionally, but what I'm really interested in is who are we being as a company? Mm. Who are our people being invited to be? And how does this thing scale? And, you know... <laughs> I guess you could blow this off as some Maslovian kind of craziness, but honestly, it goes back to the to the screw machine operator in Ohio. I I want to be a place that people flourish, mm. and I want when they go home, for them to be the catalyst for their families to flourish. And let's dream a little further. As we get better and better at that, those families go out into their communities. You know, ripples in the pond, you can, yeah. of course, see what I'm trying to draw. And if so, you know what? Wake the world. Yeah. Gee, I mean, we'll never be done doing that. But if we can enlist 100, 1,000, 100,000 people who are perhaps a little bit further along on their own aliveness, you know, that then they'll make their own ripples. And, you know, that. I'm sorry to sound like a broken record here, but capitalism can be an engine for aliveness. Yeah. And I, I think it should be. I mean, why, why not? It's, it's damn good business. Yeah. And we leave the world a better, a better place. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree, you know, and, and creating that, that level of inspiration, creating dignity. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> How many businesses think about creating dignity in their employees? That that pays big dividends. And, and when we talk about the bigger, more complicated social problems, you know, oftentimes our conversation, and I'm not trying to draw into a political conversation. I just want to use politics as an example. <laughs> but um, people will say, make sure you get out and vote. 
get out and vote. That's the end of the line. That's when all the decisions have been made and you're saying yes, no to something. Like civically involved. You talk about accountability and moms. Go be accountable in your community. Go go get involved even with your kids and go whatever it is. Garden at the uh, the local garden plots and and you know create a food bank for people or what. I'm not whatever. I'm not gonna stop making examples. But there's so many ways to get civically involved and invest some aliveness into your community because I'll tell you right now, the mayor wherever you're at needs help. They have volunteer positions open and they're desperate for someone to come in and be engaged with this, the government that they've got. And if we took time and invested in that, you know, and you were kind of said that talking about like being, you know, out there and doing these things, these ripples, Im- imagine the impact one person could have over the course of their life in their small little town by just simply donating, let's say 2000 hours over the course of 20 years of their time. That's a whole work year of somebody you know, working 40 Mm -hmm. hours. And then you can multiply that by, by, you know, people in the community and you all of a sudden you've got this vibrant, civically engaged population. There's nothing in, in, in a positive way. There's nothing that tops that, that, that is, that is a fantastic way to build a community that cares about one another, that knows one another and can really drive that aliveness thing forward. And, and that's, just, they need all these little machines that are creating aliveness, whether it's Tut Hill or, you know, the little league or whatever it is, you're, you're creating these, these moments. No, that's exactly the spirit that, that energizes me. And I hope to be you know, playing a little piece of that, right? But let's have a, let's have a little fun here. Let's say that magically tomorrow morning, the spirit of aliveness descends on Washington, D.C. What's different? Oh, boy. <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of things, right? Like uh, aliveness, you didn't say Republican or Democrat. You know, you're talking about we, us, all of us. We could definitely, and this is always going to be true, but we could definitely use, use a little less partisanship and work on. You know, what's a true bipartisan thing, a problem that we could solve, you know? And, and right now we struggle to do that because we're a bunch of jerks to one another. Well, I mean, partisanship, I, by, by my definition anyway, is ego driven. Yeah. And, and if we could, again, this is magic here, but if we could simply dispense with that and we got a bunch of smart people that no longer have to have to be paying homage to their parties, but they can actually work together to find the best answers for the country. Yeah. And if they do that well, their reelection is going to get taken care of. But that should not be part of what they think about. They should be always in search of the best answers. I don't mind so- sounding a little naive here, but I just want to have that out there as a goalpost or maybe a yardstick yeah. for us to just r- dream about what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay, so let's let's peer into the future a little bit. You know, you don't get to talk about search for aliveness because you're doing that now, and obviously that's going to grow and become its own thing. But when you peer out there as an industry leader, what do you see? What what are things that you want to maybe maybe get to one day that you can't even really put your hands on yet? Well, yeah, that's that's a challenging question, but I'll I'll, I'll give you this much. Perfect. The when we, when we started this. Um, I guess I'd use 04 as, as perhaps our earnest beginning. The, we felt alone. And the funny thing is, the, the better we understood what we were up to, the more people we found out there with a similar hunger. And I, I really believe that, and not just in the United States, because we've, we've done three-day retreats all over the world. And it's unbelievable. Sometimes the path to get there is different, but the final destination, which is the heart, and asking people to not just listen to their hearts, but trust them. You can use the word intuition. You can use your word, but for me, it's heart. That this is, I think it's a classic grassroots movement. And it's a passionate one because it's coming from deep within each of us. And so I I actually think that this bodes very positively, it bodes well for our futures. And that all we want is more and more people listening to their hearts, leaning into that and helping to wake the world. 
I, I got one more question for you, and I, I'm going to try to pull something out for that that middle manager, that person who's out there trying to struggle to to be a better version of, of where you're at. And so you're you're sort of in mentor role now, but that person who's in a corporation that isn't alive, you know, or they don't find it, and they're maybe going to transition into something else, but they've still got a job to do. They still got people whose livelihoods depend on their leadership. What's your advice for them when they're sort of just stuck and and they're not in the best place, but they want to do what they can do? What does someone like that do, Jay? Well, if I'm answering with with their best interests at heart, um, it sounds a lot like that accountability conversation. Hmm. You know, this is this isn't working for you, um, and let's let's find a different job, or we'll help you find a different place because. Uh, you just got to understand we're really serious about this and, and look around. We've got an ever increasing percentage. Oh, well, we take a step back every now and then, but an almost ever increasing percentage of folks who are, who are really showing themselves to be in on this deal. So it would be that kind of conversation for my own selfish interests, my own yes. interests at heart. You know, one of the tough lessons that we've learned along the way, particularly where you have people in influential roles, whether they're org, org chart influential roles or water cooler influential roles. If you've got people sitting around saying, oh, don't drink that Kool-Aid, they're just out to screw you. Uh, you know what? It's so easy. It's so easy for them because all they're really saying is, hey, wait, what we all know, we're all adults here. What we know is normal. I mean, this is crazy stuff. Let's go back to normal. Right. And of course, I, I'm there howling it with every chance I get. Hey, wait, 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 wait. This normal behavior, how about we get back to natural behavior without all the, all the lessons we've learned from society along the way, giving us rules that may or may not fit who we really are. I love it. Right there. Let's just call that the show, man. Thank you so much for coming on, Jay. That was powerful. And I just, I love that you were available to do this and, and to continue to spread that message. It speaks volumes about your company, but also about who you are and how you run it. I, I, I love it, man. I, I think it's incredible what you're doing. Please keep doing it. Don't be dissuaded. Every day it's going to be hard, but keep doing it because you're doing something truly unique and incredible. Well, Pete, thank, thank you very much. It's important to hear those words. But I, I was going to say something very similar to you. The, um, the energy that you bring to the show, um, you know, it's this understanding, sponsoring, um, we can make this a better world kind of an energy. Yeah. And, you, you know, for you to be taking that into the Middle East, that's terrific for you to be sharing it in, in exercises like the one we're just completing. Man, keep it up. All right, you got it. I'm gonna. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs>